Uh, I'm Andrew Plew. I'm a Beam contributor and a software engineer from Google. Uh, you probably previously heard my talks about Beam, and I've been working for a long time on Beam and Dataflow SQL. Um, so I'm now leading a team working on some relational Beam stuff. I'm not the only one working on this, though. Uh, we've got a bunch of people involved. Uh, Kyle Weaver, Brian Hewitt, Pablo Estrada, Ken Knowles. Probably heard of some of these people before. Um, so I'm going to give you a bit of talk about what some of the things we're working on and how we're going to make Beam uh, better for relational pipelines. So my agenda here is pretty straightforward for this talk. I'm going to start out telling you what is relational, how we can optimize your pipelines, what you can do today with Beam SQL, and what you'll be able to do eventually with relational Beam. I hope you've all been watching the Beam Summit. There was a talk that caught my attention this morning. Uh, Beam is kind of falling behind. I actually added this slide this morning, but the next two slides were in my talk before. Um, so Alexi and Ismail uh, gave a talk on benchmarking Beam, and it's pretty interesting. Our performance is pretty bad. Uh, it really shows why we need some of these improvements. Uh, if you're looking at comparing Beam SQL to Spark SQL or Flink SQL, a big chunk of this performance gap is actually some of these optimizations that we can't perform in Beam today. So why is Beam falling behind? Well, we haven't fundamentally changed since uh, the Beam model since it started in, in 2015. Um, and, and so this is sort of back to the Dataflow SDK it turned into Beam uh, and really, Google is still stuck on 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 a internal batch engine called Flume, that's a precursor to Beam that hasn't changed since 2010. <laughs> so um, schemas came out of SQL in, in 2018, and really they've gone into core, but they haven't brought significant improvements. They're really only a, a way to interface with Beam SQL. So what is the next big thing? That's relational Beam and core. And, and I'm going to go into this talk a bit about, about what that means. Uh, but I moved this slide to the beginning after seeing that other presentation. And really, several of these other runners have had these features since as far back as 2015. Uh, Spark added data frames in, in 2015. And Flink added relational stuff to the core starting in 2018. So this is not new stuff. It's just new to Beam stuff. And it's, it's time that we've at, we added here, too. So now that I've given you sort of a, a why, what is relational? Uh, well, relational processing involves uh, taking advantages of similarities in your pieces of data to decide how you process that data. So if you, if you know some of the metadata about your data, for example, you can take advantage of these similarities to reduce the amount of work you do. And traditional databases do this all the time. Um, you know, they control things like the, the layout of your, your data on disk, the in-memory structure of data. They can compute indexes, metadata. They know all sorts of things about how to optimize the execution. Um, so Beam is, is much more limited, but we can, we can get some of this stuff. So traditionally, Beam is just processed byte arrays. Everything's a byte array. And we provide this convenience uh, method that is called a coder that allows you to represent that as an object. But Beam doesn't know anything about your object. Uh, sometimes we get really fancy and we have group by keys and you have maybe a byte array of a key and a byte array of a value. Internally, this is how Beam is representing all your data. Um, so it's very focused on item-specific information. It's processing an item that's a byte array. Uh, for the, the, the key value case, it's, co it's co considering which keys are identical, but it's not really looking at them beyond that. So this is sort of how uh, Beam sees your pipeline. It's not relational. Uh, there are opaque boxes of data that come in, does some processing, and it spits out another opaque box. Um, but your data really looks like this. It has order. It has structure. There's more than just bytes in your data. So Beam can be relational, but we need metadata about what 
the structure of your data is. What's in that byte array? Um, is it a bunch of in integers? Is it something else? How much data can we expect to see on a, uh, a byte array? What's the rate of the stream or what is the size of a batch? Um, we also need metadata about what sort of computations you're doing. So what columns are you accessing? What transforms are you performing? Um, we don't really know any of this in Core Beam today. Schemas has changed that a little bit. Uh, it exposes the structure of your data. And this enables the beginning of relational, but you have to use SQL to get it. Um, it provides an abstraction across your data. Uh, so you can say, you know, my, my data is actually uh, uh, two integers, an integer 64 and integer 32, foo and baz. OK, so now Beam knows this stuff. Um, a lot of times, actually, uh, schemas can be inferred. Um, Java Pojos or Protos or Avro, all of that, we auto-infer schemas. But it doesn't provide any metadata about computations. Um, Another piece that's missing from schemas is actually, this is just showing up in Beam Core now, is this thing called schema IO, uh, which is we need to know about what that data is that you're reading in. Uh, so say you've got a, a source and we, we want to do something to it. Um, well, we need to know like what's the structure of the data coming in from that source. Maybe we need to know, hey, does that source support some of these optimizations I'm going to talk about? We also need to know metadata. So schema IO is still missing this piece, but we're going to add it pretty soon. And metadata here being you know, the indexes from your database, the, the statistics of how much data is there, how many of these keys are there. OK. So the one thing that is relational, and this is to say Beam does have some relational stuff. It's SQL. Uh, but we're hitting the limitations of being confined within a single SQL transform. So if you have two SQL transforms in a pipeline, well, you don't get those relational optimizations across. If you have IOs, and so this is the back to the benchmarking talk, they use SQL, but they didn't configure the IOs in SQL. They just passed IOs to SQL. Um, so none of the optimizations that we could perform get performed on those, on those IOs. So SQL just sees your, your data as some peak collection coming in. We do some optimal stuff within SQL, and then we spit peak collections out. So SQL is relational, but it's relational within a very tight box. There's also Java schema transforms, which are relational too. Um, and very few people use these, but I would encourage you to use them, uh, particularly the select one, which allows you to select certain columns on your data. But there are other uh, operators as well. There's no optimizations on these Java schema transforms, but there will be. Uh, and another caveat here is there's a filter operator that you probably should use SQL for instead. Um, some of these Java schema transforms are just as rich in terms of metadata we can derive from them as, as SQL, but not all of them are. So again, just to give you sort of a, a, an idea here, um, relational is really a model of, of saying, I have transforms that I'm performing on my data. It's the SQL model. Um, and there are other ways to express that. So once we have all this metadata, if we could get this into Beam Core, uh, how can we optimize your pipeline? Uh, so you may have seen an email that hit the list uh, on Tuesday. Um, I haven't read it yet. <laughs> I probably shouldn't be giving a talk on it if I haven't read it yet. But uh, we need really a global optimizer. It sounds like a huge project because it is. And it's going to be a lot of work. Um, effectively, today, you have a pipeline. You run some expands on it. And then that pipeline gets sent to the runner. And maybe the runner does some optimizations on it. The runner doesn't know anything about that pipeline. We don't have any way for that metadata to get there. Maybe we should we'll get there in a minute. Um, but there's a bunch of optimizations that a runner couldn't perform, even if it had the metadata. And so examples would be IO-related primarily. Um, 
one of the things we have here is there's really not a core model in Beam for how do we optimize the pipeline after expand. Where does that optimizer run? Um, eventually, we want to run optimizations in the protos, but do Python users, are they willing to, to run a Java optimizer? So this is a, a actually a pretty big problem. Um, Kyle's initial design is, is Java only, is my understanding of it. Uh, I should read that, that design doc. You should too. Um, and it's going to be a, a start of that problem. But eventually, we'll get to the place where we're optimizing portability protos. And to show you what this looks like, uh, say we take a beam graph in. And you've written some, so you've got some sources here, some IOs. I've modeled them here as table scans. This is a slide I took from a previous presentation. You've got some projects, some joins, some filters. Well, actually, that filter could be performed right after the table scan. So uh, we could have a relational optimizer that moves that filter to the earliest place in the pipeline. And to give you some of those specific filters, I'm on a, or some, some of those specific transforms uh, are my next couple slides here. So. This one is, is something that's just uh, Kyle is implementing as his, his first prototype here. But uh, we have this in, in SQL already. I'm calling it column pruning in this slide just to be very clear about what it is. Um, but it also is known potentially as project pruning or trivial project pushdown. Um, if you've spent any time looking at the relational APIs, Flink and Spark both have this. And so the idea is you want to stop passing around unused fields as soon as possible, uh, ideally at the source. Um, and so Beam Java has a model for this. It's called Field Access Descriptor. You've probably never heard of it because it's sort of hidden in schemas. Uh, but it allows your P transform to describe what fields it accesses. Uh, right now, actually, the only thing that um, there's two things that use field access descriptor. One is this new schema IO API that Kyle just implemented for performing push down to IOs, which is really cool. Uh, but the other thing is um, the schema uh, transform API, the one I showed you a couple slides back. Uh, before we get this optimizer done, SQL will support it as well. Um, so if we know what columns your, your P transform accesses, we can strip that data down sooner. So to give you an idea of a graphical view of what this looks like, you have some data that's being read from some sources. Um, you're doing some projects on it, and then maybe you're joining it, they'll trigger it. OK. Well, those projects turn out to be both trivial projects. And actually, they both have metadata that says, we're actually accessing columns A and B, and you have five other columns. Um, so we can use that field access descriptor to say, hey, you know, I just want those two columns to be read out of the database. So instead of reading the entire database into Beam, um, we just go and say, OK, we're going to take your IO. We're going to throw out that IO you gave us. And we're going to rematerialize a new IO in your graph that is the same IO, but with the metadata pushed down to the actual source saying, only read these columns. And so this could potentially save you a huge amount of data transferred from your IO to whatever's processing your Beam pipeline. And it could do that automatically. So another thing that we could pretty easily do with this is join algorithm selection and reordering. And this is another thing that Beam SQL does today. Um, but again, like, like the first one, you have to have, have your IOs created inside Beam or inside, sorry, inside Beam SQL. Um, so we can automatically choose the order of joins. We can choose the optimal joins to use. The current implementation in Beam SQL is actually pretty poor on this area. Uh, it looks at bounded versus unbounded to choose a, a join algorithm. And all we have for statistics is, is how many rows are in your table, maybe, or the rate of data, maybe. Um, we need something in core. Probably that interface will be enough to start with. Um, but we probably will want more. So to give you sort of an idea of what this looks like, maybe you wrote a graph that is has a stream coming in, is doing a side lookup join on it, is doing another 
um, side lookup join on it to two bounded data sources. Well, it obviously makes sense that you could actually turn that from two joins on the, the streaming data set to one join on the streaming data set. You just have to pre-compute the join on those two bounded data sets. Uh, so this is the sort of uh, join optimization that is trivial. Um, the other one we can do really well is uh, looking at the size of data sets, relatively speaking. And so we know that you know one of these bounded sources is really small and another is really large. And we can decide what order to perform that join in. Um, so to get more complex optimizations, we need some additional operators in core. And row expressions are probably the most useful, but also the most difficult expression to put into core. And so why are a row expression difficult? Well, it really comes down to how they're defined and what that spec looks like. So there's three operators, right? I'm going to step back a second. Um, a row expression really is the select row and where with a Boolean part of SQL. Um, so if you take your SQL statement and just take those two things, that's really, a, that's the row expression. And fundamentally, those things have three operators that are uh, in them. There's a field access, which is field access descriptor. We talked about that. It, field access descriptor is just a, you know, here are the columns you're, you're caring about. There's a constant. And we actually have a constant in core, right, through schema values. Uh, but the third one is the difficult one, and this is the arbitrary function call. Um, who defines what those function calls are? How do you validate that they're correct? Um, every runner, it turns out, has slightly different semantics if they have their own native ones. Um, Google internally wants to standardize on Zeta SQL, but open source engines have mostly standardized on Calcite. And it turns out, if you look at Flink and Spark, their implementations don't actually mesh with Calcite a lot of times. Everyone has their own implementation of operators. And so part of the hard part here is how do we find what that common ground is and how do we validate that it's actually common? Um, this also extends to IOs because you're going to do a push down into an IO and that IO might have its set of operators. So things like equality is easy. Um, I think we're going to initially end up with something where we'll have like equality greater than, less than. You'll have a couple trivial operators, but eventually you're going to want to do more. So what is a trim operator? Define trim. You have a function that parses a JSON object. What does that look like? Uh, you have a function that computes a hash. What does that look like? Uh, so these are all things that we'll need to figure out eventually, but Initially, we'll just need a, a, an expression language in core before we can do some of these next transforms I'm going to talk about. So filter pushdown. Flink and Spark have this, which means they do have some level of a expression language in core. Um, this is actually meshes really well with the project pushdown, because frequently, columns are only needed to apply filters. So if we can push a project into an IO and we can push a filter into an IO, we can probably push even more of the project into the IO. Um, more column pruning. Again, we don't have a core model for what a filter pushdown looks like in Beam. We need to build this out and that's probably a couple months out before we get there. Uh, we're gonna figure out the optimizer first. Um, but we really need to define this row expression language. So Beam SQL has an implementation of this. And it's based on Calcite uh, rel nodes, or rex nodes, sorry, which is the uh, um, row expression node. Um, we don't really want to push Calcite into Beam Core. Um, so sometimes you can push down uh, uh, subcomponents of complex expressions. And you can break up things where maybe a lower layer doesn't support the entire thing, but it supports sub bits. And we actually do really poorly about this in Beam SQL. Um, so this is an area that actually, even once we get it implemented, uh, writing rules to do good filter pushdown will take a long time. Um, but just having this will make a big difference in terms of uh, efficiency of reading data from various sources. So to give you an example of what this looks like, 
Um, this is very similar to that first slide. You've got some projects, you've got a join, you've got a filter. Well, we can just filter that data before we even read it into Beam. Um, another place that this is actually really useful is sometimes your data sources have shards or partitions. And we can, if we can tell the, the data source, hey, we're just looking at this data, or you know, we're looking at all the data that is from this date, uh, they can go on compute, hey, I, I'm just looking at this shard. And so this will actually save a lot of work in both the Beam and the IO, because uh, you can significantly filter down that data you're reading. So this is one that is basically the same as that earlier project pushdown. But once we have a more detailed uh, row expression language, we can define more complex operators. So this could be computing a hash in an input field or some other simplification. It's again, the, the you wanna stop passing around this unused data as soon as possible. Maybe you have an image that's part of your input data set, but you really only need the hash of that image. Uh, what if you could compute that hash at the data source and never send the, the image into Beam at all? Say you're reading from like a big query table. Um, it turns out that column printing might be enough, but we might also wanna push down more. Uh, there's been discussions on, on both the dev and user mailing list about maybe we should push down limits. Maybe we should push down joins. Um, that's all things that we can consider once we have this optimizer. Uh, Beam SQL has support for this, but it doesn't push into an IO. So it's only limited to column printing in IOs today. So this is, this is getting into very experimental territory. But to show you what this looks like, you might have a, a pipeline that has got a project and a filter and you end up with just Beam performing the join, nothing else. All of the rest of your computations happen before the data even gets read in. And this is really a much more efficient pipeline. So the last sort of thing that row expressions would give us is a way to actually natively execute row expressions, uh, a row expression evaluator. Um, there's a team inside Google that took our row expression engine that's used by Cloud Spanner and put it into Beam. And their prototype is 10x faster than a native C++ pipeline. We have effectively the equivalent of Beam and C++. Um, and we know that that's already several times faster than Beam Java. So it's not clear how easy it'll be to actually make this work. Uh, the big problem is every engine has its own data type. So how will, how will a Beam row map to a Flink and Spark equivalent? Uh, how will they map to a Dataflow equivalent? Um, this is a, a problem um, that we'll eventually have to solve. Um, there's also potentially that overhead of type conversions between Beam types and these engines native types. Um, you know, everyone has a slightly different system for describing these things. Not only are the operators different, but the types are different. And these particularly show up around timestamps, floating points, large numeric types. But the, the wins here are potentially huge, right? So you may have seen this slide before. I presented this at the 2019 Beam Summit. You've got a set of, of, of SQL today. You write some SQL, it turns into a Java Pardo. It goes down to the runner. They have a Java Pardo, great. But really, you wanna take that Java Pardo, you wanna turn it into some abstract relational expression and you wanna turn it into Flink SQL. Why? Because you get a, a easily a 10X performance boost doing that. So eventually we wanna optimize this pipeline, not just in Beam, but also in the runners. We wanna give runners these metadata uh, about your pipeline not just schema, but also about the computations you're performing. And when runners can perform their own optimizations, they can do things a lot better than you could and a lot better than Beam could. So enough about this particular track. What if we wanna optimize in Beam itself a bit? Um, this is something that maybe, maybe a path that not a lot of uh, runners support necessarily, but could be very useful. And I know, I think I think I saw some internal changes in Flink that may support some of this stuff. 
Um, and I know other other runners support it, but I'm not sure quite how much. Vectorized execution is the idea of you effectively have your data in, ra in arrays and you're running for loops. This looks a lot like Beam, uh, except the for loop isn't exposed and your data is actually structured as rows. But if you could restructure that data as arrays and had loop iterating over it, things would be a lot more efficient in memory. And one of the reasons we haven't done this is Java actually has pretty bad support for vectorized execution. But starting in Java 16, there's a JIT support for, for vectorized execution. And potentially, we can get these performance gains just by changing the in-memory uh, data structure that represents batches. Uh, so this is actually, there's actually a prototype of this in the Beam Data Frames Python implementation that calls into a C++ library that does some of these vectorized execution. Uh, to show you what that looks like, today in Beam, your data comes in and it's just a, a, you know, a series of unconnected operations. But if we could collect those into, into bundles, and we do actually collect them into bundles for batch, uh, and process the complete bundle through each each step of your pipeline, we could have something much more efficient in terms of, of an in-memory data structure. So instead of uh, treating them as rows in memory, we can treat them as columns. And now you can use these, these array operators to um, perform your computations. And in fact, thanks to that Java JIT stuff, uh, your, your parties probably wouldn't change in Java. It's just an in-memory data structure change. Um, so the big piece here though, is how do you convert from that, that's that, uh, sort of data is just, uh, rows to columns, uh, in streams, this doesn't necessarily provide you with a performance boost, um, because you're ending up with batches of one, but it turns out, uh, we built this for the Zeta SQL C++ reference implementation, um, that sometimes you have a backlog. And so if you adaptively batch your data when you have a, back a backlog, you can actually get uh, this columnar structure in memory based on just reading everything out of the backlog before you process an element. Um, so something like this could result in very similar performance for streams, very similar performance gains for streams when they need the most, which is when they have a backlog. And like I said before, Python Data Frames does this today but we need to move this into core to fix uh, some limitations there. Particularly, we lose window information and it turns out it's really expensive. Um, talking about expensive, uh, converting between these two formats is actually really expensive. So if we could keep it in that columnar format for as long as possible, that would make things a lot more efficient. Um, so thanks to schemas again, we may actually be able to do this entirely within the schema coder. Um, we could pivot the existing row into a columnar format with actually no visible, no user visible changes in a lot of cases. Um, and so columnar again is that array format. But there's another thing called Apache Arrow, which we will probably end up using. Um, if we had Apache Arrow as a coder in, in, in Beam Core, uh, not only would we have these more efficient uh, computations for a lot of cases, but we'd also be a lot more efficient about uh, converting between, say, Apache Arrow or Google's internal expression evaluator that I talked about earlier and your data that's in process. So just to give you an idea of what this looks like, instead of treating things as individual little blobs, we treat them as columns of things. Um, it's a slightly different data structure. It's effectively, instead of a array of byte arrays, it's an array of an array of byte arrays. Uh, and sometimes these things have just one element and that's, you don't get much gain there, but really it's, it's where you have a batch or a bundle of elements. So um, the hard part here is that potentially the worker needs to be aware of these changes and the runner probably does too. Um, it may be possible to just do it at the worker harness level. We don't really know yet. We're it's, it's ways off. So one of the additional optimizations that this enables is sort of a zero copy project, which is you have a column that you're projecting without changing it at all. 
Um, you may not even need to deserialize that column. Um, so for for columnar data formats, this is this is a clear benefit. Uh, for streaming, even with a single element, this may actually be a benefit for a large or expensive field. And so if you're wondering what a large or expensive field is, if you have a byte array in your byte array, if you have a byte array as one of your fields, uh, those are large. Uh, you might have something that's very big and you just want to keep the pointer to that byte array. Uh, but you might also have something that's expensive. And in Java, strings are very expensive. Uh, it turns out converting from a, a the serialized format of string, which is byte array, to a, a actual Java string requires validating and parsing all of the UTF-8 uh, characters in there. So this can actually be a very expensive operation. If you run a profile on a Beam SQL pipeline, you'll find a lot of our time is spent there. Um, there's no core model yet for this, but we can possibly do it with just internal changes. Um, so an example of how this might work, if we had metadata about what column you're performing your computation on, we could potentially apply your transform on just that column, not even give you access to the column that you're just passing through. Um, and then in the end state, uh, that column might not even be loaded into memory. So before I worked on Beam, I worked on distributed storage systems. And in that world, sort of ideal state for this sort of operation was to provide a, a pointer to the value on disk. So you know, you're, you're, you're reading in something and we don't even need to load it into memory until you actually uh, try to access it. So if you have a, an IO that performs a lookup, maybe we decide to, to, leave, to leave those big chunks of data at the source. Uh, if you've gone through a shuffle, maybe we don't read the shuffle values until we actually need them. Um, again, a lot of this will, will, will start getting deep down to the runners. But just once you have the in-memory columnar format, it's pretty straightforward to just pass around a, a column that's unmodified without doing any manipulation on it or any copies on it. So another big thing, taking advantage of that, that UTF-8 conversion overhead. Um, is deferred to serialization. So right now, when you when you have a record come in, as soon as as soon as that beam row, that schema row comes in, uh, we deserialize all the fields and turn them into in-memory objects. But maybe you have a big expensive string field that you never read. Um, or maybe you do a filter before you read that big expensive string field. But we don't need to convert from the byte array format to the string format until you actually try to access that string. Um, again, with the schema API, the schema row API, this should probably be an internal only change. And you know, other things about your data, your data might have an order. There's a bunch of simplifications we can perform if we, we know what the order of your data is. Again, no core model for this, but it could be as simple as time, it could be another key. Uh, effectively, an order aware P collection would allow us to uh, drop complexity around late data processing due to out of order events for cases where you don't care about it. Um, and the last sort of big thing, this, this, this is something that people have been talking about for forever and maybe we'll never get, uh, but you're really, your data is just a change log. Uh, right now, Beam gives you an append-only change log. What happens when you delete something? Like you had you had an event come through and actually, no, I'm not doing that anymore. Uh, what happens when you have an update or a change to something that came through? Um, if we had some way to express that, we could actually save recomputations through aggregations. Um, and we could do better things about how we write your data out to IOs. Um, Figuring out how this works with IOs turns out to be the big uh, painful piece. So someday we might think about that. Okay, I got 10 minutes left here. I'm gonna power through these set of slides here. I already powered through all my slides, but uh, uh, this is basically just, hey, what can you do with Beam SQL today? Big announcement, SQL Transform is no longer experimental. And I'm going to give you the caveat of technically haven't merged the PR yet, but I got an LGTM on it. Um, it's coming in Beam uh, 2.33, specifically for the Calcite SQL Transform. 
If you want to LGTM the, the pull request, it's right there. Uh, maybe I'll merge it at the end of this talk. Uh, I don't know if the test has passed yet. But um, So Beam SQL, it's Apache Calcite. We use Calcite for everything. Um, sort of to give you an idea of what it looks like, um, you write a SQL statement, you pass it into the SQL transform that I talked about. Um, we do some parsing, some validation. All this happens inside Apache Calcite. And eventually, it's turned back into a pipeline. Um, so I, I, SQL is basically a relational model with filter projects, joins. Um, again, it's, it's that model that we want to push into core to give you an idea of how easy this is going to be. Here's what the Kelsite model looks like. OK, you've got some table scans. You've got a filter project, whatever. Ta-da. Uh, so really, the piece that we're missing for relational uh, here is how do we get this metadata to st into the Beam core model? Instead of these things just being P transforms, they need to be P transforms with metadata. Um, so SQL uses Kelsite's Volcano Optimizer. And we really hope to reuse this Volcano Optimizer as our, our core relational optimizer. But we'll see. Um, at very least, we'll have an interface that we can plug in different things. So maybe not everyone will use Kelsite. But um, there's a, a bunch of nodes. And so uh, Calc is really can really just describe like an arbitrary P transform. Um, it's a P transform with metadata about what it does. Uh, our party with metadata about what it does. Join maps pretty straightforward to beams, join, operator. Um, some of these things are pretty straightforward mapping to beam. Most of them are. Um, so I talked about an expression evaluator earlier. It turns out that beam SQL has two implementations of this expression evaluator. Um, both are in Java. It's just a simple pardo that one wraps the Calcite code generator and the other wraps uh, Zeta SQL's reference implementation. Um, so we have it, we have proof of concepts that both of these things work. To give you an idea what it looks like, you have this expression, it turns into Java code. Um, yay. And then the last sort of piece about Beam SQL that, that you might care about a little bit is Zeta SQL. I get lots of questions about Zeta SQL. Um, Zeta SQL showed up in Beam SQL as, as something, a way to give you compatibility with the BigQuery SQL syntax. Really, we used it to build a product called uh, Dataflow SQL. Um, if, you, if you think that you're going to take your arbitrary BigQuery query and run it on uh, uh, Dataflow or Beam, you will be sadly mistaken. <laughs> you will file like five bug reports to me, and then you'll walk away. Um, but if you think of it as something where you're gonna you're gonna write some simple transforms on streaming pipelines in a SQL syntax that you know, uh, you'll be happy. Um, the one thing about Zeta SQL in in Beam is that it is still experimental. We're not removing experimental from it. Um, if you're just gonna go write SQL in Beam, I would highly encourage you to use the Calcite dialect because it has a much more mature implementation. So eventually, you're going to want to use relational beam. And this thing is sort of vaporware at this point. Uh, I wish I had a product for you. Uh, but as you've seen on the, on the mailing list, like we are actively working on this. Uh, what can you do, though? Well, you need schemas. Um, beam needs to know the structure of your data. So if you can, use rows. Um, if you can't, at least make sure you're using types that are schema aware. Uh, all of our initial optimizations are going to require a row. Um, eventually, we might have some optimizations that work without that schema row. And I'm going to say, if you're not using schema, you get nothing. So use schemas. Um, relational Beam also needs schema I.O. And I talked again a bit uh, again about what that was at the beginning. It's just a standardized interface on I.O.s. Um, as a user of Beam, you don't actually care about schema I.O. It's going to be retrofitted into existing I.O.s. It's not a replacement for builders. Uh, it may be completely invisible to you. But if you're a I.O. builder, we need schema I.O. on your I.O. And it's really just adding interfaces, describing 
um, you know, the metadata about your I.O., uh, how you perform or a, using a standardized interface to perform for reject and filter pushdowns, implementing a standard interface to give us metadata about what your I.O. is going to output. Um, and finally, all of our initial optimizations are going to need field access descriptor. So use schema transforms or use SQL transforms, or even you can annotate your Java Pardus with a field access uh, annotation. Maybe someday we'll have static analysis and we'll just uh, get all this for free. But for now, you, you really need to annotate your, your uh, uh, Pardus if you want to get some of these benefits. And really, we're going to want more. So I would encourage you, whenever you're possible, like you're going to have some complex things that you're going to write in your pipeline that you can't do with schema transform SQL or data frames. But if you can do it with SQL, a schema transform SQL or data frames, use those things. Uh, you know, eventually, we hope a lot of these relational optimizations will just be a, hey, I upgraded to Beam 2.34, and I got something for free. Uh, it really should be an incentive for you to upgrade, and very little work should be required to support these. Um, but you will need to use schemas, and you will need to use interfaces that give us the metadata we need to provide these optimizations. So thank you for my lightning talk, but it was 40 minutes long. Uh, hopefully, we've got some questions.